My friends, there's some examples of character that you need to write down. Now, why do we call, for example, the alphabet characters? Because A is always A. B is B at 2 a.m. in the morning. C is still C, whether it's in Africa, Asia, or in the Bronx. It doesn't change. That's why we call them characters. Why do we call numbers characters? Because one is always one, and two is always two. Whether you are using it in the night or the day, it doesn't change. It's character. Why do we call statues characters? Because, like Victoria, no matter what happens around them, they never change. Why do we call principles characters? Because principles are laws. They never change. You know, one of the secrets to my success as a coach of government leaders and business leaders, one of my secrets of being an effective communicator, one of my secrets of being a good teacher is simple. It's not my education. The secret to my success is I only teach principles. That's it. You can never disagree with a principle. You can ignore it. You can hate it. But you can never disagree with it. For example, gravity is a principle. You could fast and pray and speak in tongues, but if you jump off a building, you're going to die. Why? You are violating a principle. Character is that way. That's why a person with character does not live on what's popular. They live on what is principle. And this is why it's very difficult for politicians to have character. Because politics is based on popularity. Which means you will literally sacrifice your principles to protect your popularity. Which cancels your character. Which means you cannot be trusted. There are preachers who are politicians. They would sell their principles for a pot of porridge. No character. Character, therefore, is simply that which is unchanging. Write it down. Uh, my question is, how often do you change? Who are you? Are you the same person all the time? Are you consistent? Are you predictable? Leaders must have character. Why? Write this down. People will not follow you if they don't trust you. So character attracts loyalty. I want to give a few more definitions of character for you to understand how serious it is. First of all, character is a commitment to a set of values without compromise. What are values? Values are things you value. That's all. Not complicated. For example, if you value your marriage vow, you will never commit adultery. So when a person commits adultery, 
They don't value their marriage, nor their marriage vows. So you can't respect them. And they lose the trust of their spouse and their children and even their in-laws and perhaps even the church that they are part of. See, your values will protect you. Secondly, character is the dedication to a set of standards without wavering. What are your standards that you've set for your life? My standards produce my character. I will never violate my standards. You got to say that every day. I do not tell lies. That's a standard. I do not steal. That includes stealing time from your job. Telling people you are sick when you are not sick. This is a lack of character. You are a thief. I wonder why you're smiling. See, you don't understand. Character is so subtle. There's no excuse in life for breaking your standards. You know, I've heard business people say, and I talk to them, I've even, you know, in some of my business dealings and my negotiations for business investments, I sit with people. Many people come to me, they want to do business with me, and they want me to invest in their companies, and, you know, I do a lot of this stuff. And, and, they, and I hear people say sometimes, honesty is my best policy. Now, whenever you tell me that, I do what Joseph did. Honesty should never be your best policy. Never. Because best policy means I have second best, third best, fourth best, fifth best. I can't trust you. You have no character. A person of character would say, honesty is my only policy. Thirdly, character is self-imposed discipline for the sake of moral convictions. Character is what? Self-imposed discipline. That means a person of character doesn't need the police. They police themselves. A person of character locks themselves up in the prison of their own convictions and they throw away the key do you have character are you for sale see your future depends on your character not your charisma and most leaders whether they are politicians, preachers, or parents, they try to live of their charisma. They try to live of their talent. They try to live of their gifts. Your gifts will never protect you. As a matter of fact, your gift will destroy you. Because the only thing that can protect your gift and your talent is your character. This session is the most important session you ever sat in in your life. Because this is where you learn what protects your entire future. And it's your character. And you've never been taught this in your whole life. I know you haven't. Your seminary never had a class on this. And that's why preachers are falling like flies. You know, I think about it. Character is really what I call a constant effort to integrate 
your words, your deeds, and your actions as one. Everybody say integrate. integrate. The word integrate, integrate, means to become one. This is very important. Write that down. To integrate means what? To become one. So character is when your words, your deeds, and your actions are one. You are not schizophrenic. A person without character will say one thing do another and promise something else. So you never know who you're talking to when you're talking to them. No character. Now here's a surprise. Number five. Character is sacrifice for principles. So character means you are willing to sacrifice friendship to protect your principles. You are willing to lose your best friend in order to keep your principles. Do you have character? Who are you with right now that you shouldn't be with? Think about it. What are you doing right now in secret that you shouldn't be doing? Are you willing to sacrifice that to protect your principles? Somebody offered to pay your mortgage off if you just sleep with them once. Would you sacrifice to protect your principles? Character. I like this last one. Character is simply integrity. Everybody say integrity. integrity. Now look at integrity and look at integrate. They're the same word. Integrity means you are one with yourself. Integrity means that you are one with yourself. Do you know when I did some research some years ago on the word in the Hebrew, for holiness, write the word holy down, I discovered that the root word for holy is one. One. <laughs> the Hebrew concept of holiness is integrity. One. That means you are one. The number one confession in the Bible about God is the Lord our God is one. Now some of you don't understand why that's important. If you were to talk to a Jewish rabbi right now in this city and ask him, when you meet them, ask them, when you see them, ask them, what is the most important confession in the Bible? They will tell you, the Lord our God is one. What does it mean? It means he's holy. What is holy? You are one. This is very interesting. Holiness means you are integrated. You are not more than one person. <laughs> You are not a different person on Monday that you are on Tuesday. You're not a different person in the night at 2 a.m. than you are in the pulpit on Sunday morning. You, you are one. You are not multi-personality. When the Bible says be holy, it's telling you be one. Stop being a hypocrite. It's character. The foundation for trust is integrity. Write it down. Tweet that to somebody right now. What did I say? The foundation of trust is integrity. 
When you are one, people will eventually trust you. That means your word is always good. You say what you said, you do what you said, and then you act what you said. That's holiness. So wearing a long dress or a white collar with a purple shirt turned backward with a big chain in your pocket is not holiness. Wearing a long robe with a turban on your head doesn't impress me. I want to know if one person is under that robe, just one. You can call me, you know, you can bring your card to me and show me all your titles. Right, reverend, honorable, bishop, eternal, sacred man of God. I don't care what you say. I still don't trust you. I don't. Because I don't know which one of you I'm talking to. That's why the Bible says... Know them that labor among you. Don't just bring anyone into your church to preach. Even if they are on TV. Don't be attracted to charisma. Seek out character. You know, some years ago, my wife and I hosted a marriage conference in our church. And I met this guy when I was doing a show for the 700 Club with Pat Robertson in Virginia Beach. And I was doing a series of programs with him and the people there. And I met this guy, and he did a show on marriage, you know, and strengthening marriages. It's older guy. And I was so impressed. He had a book and everything and sounded good. I didn't know him. I just met him for the first time. And we were having this marriage conference in our church in the Bahamas. And I said, you know, this guy sounds good. So I approached him and I invited him to come to the Bahamas. He was so excited to come to the Bahamas. <laughs> so he came to the Bahamas and he did the seminar with me and it was a wonderful session and everything. He brought his wife with him. And then two months later, I saw an article where he got a divorce from the woman that was with him, his wife. I was confused. So, I... <laughs> I called him up, he was living in Colorado at the time, and I said, uh, I just want to make sure that this article I'm reading is not true. Uh, are you divorcing your wife, who was with you when you did a seminar for my people, who believed you? And he began to try and explain himself. I said, you will never come back to our church, and you will never come back to our island. I hung the phone up and called the bookstore. I said, take every one of his books off the shelf. Because if what he is teaching is not working for him, it shouldn't be taught to us. Yeah. Write this down. Lead with your life. Your life is the weight of your words. What did I say? Tweet that right now to someone. <laughs> See, that's the problem with us. We, we think that we are impressed by our language, you know, with these deep things we say and how good we can speak and preach and how we can, ah, hallelujah, yes, Lord. Listen, brother, you ain't got no life. Amen.
<laughs> you know, it's like it's like a guy who sells diamond, but he ain't wearing none. Never trust a salesman who don't use what he's selling. <laughs> Clap. <laughs> I am faithful to my wife so that you could believe my words. I am a good father to my children so you could believe my words. Let me put it this way. There's no such thing as a personal life. Write it down. There's no such thing as a private life. Write it down. So don't you ever tell people what I do in private is none of your business. It is my business. Because it determines whether I trust what you say publicly. It's called character. As a matter of fact, I have come to the conclusion that a person of character doesn't need to talk. They don't need to talk. They just show up. When I first met Nelson Mandela, it was the most overwhelming moment in my life. Private dinner, 16 people. He had just come out of prison. His first trip was to the Bahamas. He wanted to meet my prime minister, Sir Lyndon Penley, who was the first one to agitate for his freedom out of prison. So he wanted to come and thank my prime minister personally. So his first trip out of prison was to my country. And the prime minister called me and he invited 16 people to the dinner. And I was one of them. I don't know. That's such an honor to meet an icon. I think some of you saw the photograph of us together a couple of times. When I, when I my God, when I saw him, I saw a character on two legs. <laughs> he didn't have to speak. Do you know why? He went to prison for 18 years oh. plus seven and never changed his conviction. Mm. Hey, boy, say never change? Never change. That's why you respect him. When I come back to New York, Will you have the same wife? Yes. Don't answer it. Don't answer the question. It's just a rhetorical question. I want you to think about it. This is a serious question. How stable are you? That is why the young people are so confused. You know what the Bible says about uh, parenting? The Bible says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, some of you don't know what that big word means, so I'll explain it to you. <laughs> the word exasperate means to frustrate because of instability. You tell your child, don't smoke. And you are smoking. Yes. You are creating a monster in your house. You tell your daughter, who is 16, don't get pregnant. And you had her out of wedlock. See, don't feel bad. I got you today. See, the problem is, your daughter could tell you, but you did it. <laughs> Everybody say, lead with your life. Lead with your life. See, your words mean nothing. Character protects your words. Write it down. What did I say?
You know, I was reading the Bible, and I saw this passage here in Genesis 126, and it blew me away. You're about to get some revelation. Sit up straight, take a deep breath. Okay. Genesis chapter 1, my favorite verse in the Bible. I talk about it every day. Because this verse is a summary of why you was created. It says, and God said, let us make man in what? Our own image. Remember now the word man is plural. So he's talking about the whole species. Let us make a species called man out of our own spirit and in our own image. And he will be obviously like us. Us referring to the plurality of God's oneness. Now, what's the next statement? Let them have dominion. I want you to notice something here. This is very important. Write this down. Image before dominion. What did I say? One more time. Do you remember the definition we gave of character? Do you remember the word image? Okay, this is important. You see, the word image is the word for character. So every human being was designed to lead. That's what God gave you dominion for. And leadership was never given over people. It was given really in an area of gifting. Everyone in this room was born to lead, but not to lead people. You were born to lead in an area of gifting, and your gifting attracts people. The attraction makes you a leader. Did you understand what I just said? So you've been taught that leadership is only for a certain group of people. That's a lie from the pit of hell. He told all of us to have dominion. Everybody is a ruler, but not over people. You were created to have leadership in an area of gifting. And your gift is what makes you valuable to the world. The Bible says your gift makes room for you where? In the world and will bring you before great kings. Not your education, your gift. That's why most people with PhDs are failures. Because you can have a PhD and not know your gift. Most educated, work, educated people work for people who dropped out of school. Did you know that? Like Stephen Jobs, <laughs> Bill Gates. These folks didn't finish school. But they found their gift. That is probably why you still broke. Because all you are is employed. You've never been deployed. Your gift is when you deploy yourself. You are powerful, but you don't know it. Because your culture trains you to get a job, not to find your gift. So most of you have been miseducated. And your life is miserable. You are 50 years old and still don't know why you were born. Because your culture taught you to get an education to get a job. And then when they finish with you, they lay you off. They retire you and they throw you to the curb. Your gift is what you want to find. All of my books that I've written, all of them, I make sure each book has in it how to find your gift. If you bought a book from me today, you're going to be transformed when you read it. Because if you find your gift, you become very dangerous. You become unemployable. Your gift is your leadership fruit. Write that down. What do I mean by that? Have you noticed that uh, a fruit tree, when it bears a fruit, 
it never brings the fruit to you. Let me say it again over here. These folks look a little wise over here. I said, when a, a fruit tree bears its fruit, it never brings the fruit to you. Is that right? Exactly. It just bears the fruit. What happens? You are attracted to the tree. Your gift is your fruit that God gave you on the inside to serve the world. That's why Jesus said, if you want to be great, you become a servant to everybody. What do you mean? You serve them your gift and they find you. This is why true leaders never seek followers. Write it down. What did I say? Yeah, followers are attracted to true leaders. But they are not attracted to you. You've got to be careful. They are attracted to your gift. So because people are coming to you doesn't mean they like you. You got to protect yourself from them. They are coming for what? Your fruit. Tell your neighbor, I don't trust you. You just want my fruit. Somebody clap with me. Just clap. Praise God. You want my fruit. So God made you to be a leader with a gift. Now, that means you were born to dominate in an area of gifting. But now watch God work, okay? Write this down. Very important. The character is the very essence of God. That's why the Lord our God is one. So God himself is character. That's why you can trust him. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I wonder if you are. Who are you, man? Are you this person all the time sitting in this room? What do you do at 2 a.m. in the front of your computer that we don't know about? Character. God is character. Number two, God boasts that he never changes. Am I right? All through the Bible. He says, I never change. I never change. There's no shadow of turning with me. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord is one. I never change. He's telling you about character. Therefore, that is why we can trust him. He's stable. God said, heaven and earth would have to pass away before I break my word. Now that's character. He would sacrifice the universe in order to keep his word. So, watch God go to work now. So God is going to create this man and the first gift God gave the man was not power. The first gift God gave the man was not dominion. You know, many of you get excited about the dominion, dominion, you know, I got dominion, hallelujah, I got dominion. No, shut up, man. That's not what God gave you first. Read it, the Bible. The Bible says the first thing God gave you is what? He gave you image. Amen. Which means that character is more important than power. There are people who would come to me and say, Dr. Monroe, I want you to pray for me to receive the anointing of God. And I would ask them, do you have the character to contain it? Power will kill you without character.
And God knew it. And God says, the first thing I must give this creature is character. The image of God. So God's priority is character. God's commitment is that character is necessary before dominion. God is more concerned about your character than your dominating the earth. Character is God's prerequisite for dominion and rulership. Character is God's foundation for leadership. God says, look, before I give you power, let me give you the most important thing. Here's image. What is image? Characteristics. You are stable just like me. I could trust you with power. Now let me just say this, and, and those who bought the book on character, it's going to change your life. I'm telling you, 40 years of research. Write this down. Here's what I discover, and it, it's in the book. I do a whole chapter on it. I discovered this. Three things will test your character. Only three things. There are three things that will manifest your character. They will tell you whether you have character or not. The three things. The first one is power. When you give a person power, their character shows up. Number two, money. When you give a human a lot of money, their real self shows up. And number three, access to sex. If you give a human access to sex, their character shows up or their lack of it. Only three things. So if you want to know what a woman really is, give her power, money, and access to sex. You want to know what a man is really like? Give him power, money, and access to sex. And that is why every human on this earth that have ever failed was because of either power, money, or sex. Period. character. I wonder if you're going to make it to the end, man. See, that's the question. Don't, don't answer the question, please. This is serious, because you don't know. The Bible says the race is not to the swift. See, you could be famous instantly, man. But in the kingdom of God, the race is not to the swift. Who gets to the top first? The race is to him who endures to the end. Will you still be around when I come back 10 years from now? And will you still be the same person? That's the question. Character. Queen Victoria is still there. 289 years later. She outlived every storm, every hurricane. I wonder if you'll still be standing when all the temptations have passed. The only way to test character is by temptation. Write it down. The word temptation is not a negative word. Someday I'll come back and teach on it. But in the book, I do a whole chapter on temptation. Because temp tempering, to temper, write the word temper, to, to, to tempt or to temper means to test for weakness. That's all it means. You will never, ever have a time in your life when you are free from temptation. Never. So get over it. Get used to it. <laughs> Tempting will constantly be in your life to monitor your character. Hmm. Your character is as strong 
as the temptation you fell for. Do you know what made Eve pick the fruit? It wasn't difficult. Satan says, look, do you want to be like God? That was the temptation. What is God? Power. Of course, he lied to her because she was already like God, but Satan will always tempt you with what you already are. So your greatest danger is ignorance of self. You cannot tempt me to be what I know I already am. So somewhere Eve became ignorant of who she was. So Satan tempted her for weakness. Do you want to be like God? Well, read the verse. Let us make man in our own image and like us. She already was like God. But ignorance will make you disbelieve yourself. Character. Number six, God gave character before power. Say it. God gave character before power. Say it again. One more time. Amen. God created you, and you were given the mandate to dominate earth with God's character. It's not a difficult thing. You are a king, just like your father. But your territory is earth. Therefore, image is the first thing God gave you. And God gave you that because he knew that without character, the power will destroy you. You know, people say power corrupts. And power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely. I used to believe that. That's not true. Power does not corrupt. Power simply reveals corruption. You are already defective. You finally got a chance to show it. Power is pure. character. So the fall of man distorted the image of God. What is image? Character. So man became a defective character. And the result of it is that his self-worth fell. Man didn't know how much he was worth anymore. So ever since that, man has been hiring, read my lips, read my lips, image consultants. Why would you hire an image consultant? Because you ain't got none. You ain't got no image. You lost it. If you know who you are, and you decide to be who you are, you don't need nobody to create another person. An image consultant is someone you pay to create a person that doesn't exist. Politicians hire image consultants. Why? They ain't got no image. So they pay people to tell lies. Movie stars, entertainers, they hire image consultants. Why? They have no image. So they sell you an image that don't exist and you buy it. And then when the real person shows up, like that young guy in Florida the other day, what's his name? Bieber or something? Justin Bieber. All of y'all are shocked. I'm not. I knew that that wasn't him who was on stage. <laughs> Many passes are just like that little boy. 
Tomorrow morning, this city will be filled with performers in the pulpit. They haven't been caught yet, that's all. <laughs> you know, most people ask for forgiveness simply because they got caught. Character. Oh, I have 129 slides. This is slide number four. My time is up. You went to Bible school and they gave you a diploma, but they never gave you character. So you could preach, but you ain't got no principles. You're not going to make it. Your future is predictable. You never worked on character. A guy from a hotel called me the other day, general manager of hotel. He says, I need to order 80 of your character books. So I said, why? He says, I just read it. It changed my life as a general manager. And I'm going to give every staff member in this hotel this book. And I'm going to pay them to read it, he says. He said, this is the only thing that's missing in our lives. Character. He asked me to come and do a seminar in the hotel now. So, you know, we're going to sign a contract and I'll do some work with him. He said, this is what's missing at all levels. Managers, supervisors, downline workers, secretaries. People are not stable. Cannot be trusted. Because they never learn character. Let me close with this because my time is gone. The principal trait of fallen man is unpredictability. You cannot predict a sinner. You don't know what they're going to do next. Am I right? Some of you are married one of them. <laughs> you don't know what they're going to do next. Humans are struggling with unfaithfulness. Hmm? They're not stable. And so I put it to you, my friend, as we take a break before the last segment, which to me is one of the most important. Oh, did I go too fast? Did y'all go too fast? I'm controlling it, girl. <laughs> not them, me. You writing too slow. Take a photograph of it, praise <laughs> the Lord. It's my friend over there. Come on, right fast, quick, quick. You're holding me up. Oh, they in the way? Move the camera, man. You guys getting in trouble today. These folks want to get the notes. Don't stand in front of that screen, all right? Is this good stuff today? Yeah. I came here because I want you to make it. Are you going to make it? Yes. That means you got to make a decision in this room before you leave. Yes. That you are going to get rid of things that can destroy your character. Amen. And that might include some friends. That's right. True. That includes some habits. You are in danger. All that you built, everything you built with your whole life, could be destroyed in five seconds. Ask Jimmy Swigert. You think you're safe, huh? 
you better protect your character. You are as safe as your character. I want to give you these last two slides before we close. What's the source of values? Values, again, remember, they produce character. Okay? So you got to get your values right. Uh, the most powerful component in leadership is philosophy. Why? Philosophy is your belief system. Your belief system is a result of the things you value. Whatever you value, you believe in. Your belief system produces your values. And your values produce your morals. So morality is really a product of your values. If I value my marriage vow, then morally I will be faithful to my wife. It, it, it's related. And then when my morals are in place, morals inform ethics. So it is unethical for me to sleep with another woman. Why? Because my morals dictate that I cannot violate my values. So I protect my character. And if my ethics are in place, my ethics produce my character. And my character becomes my lifestyle. Remember I told you, you don't lead out of your position. You lead out of your life. I want you to remember one thing I say. You may never see me again. Remember this. There is no private life. Get that through your head quickly. You must live loudly. A person of character doesn't care if you discover their private life. If you are afraid that I might find out about your private life, you have no character. You are a character. <laughs> What's your problem over here? These folks are slow over here. We gotta pray for them. Huh? <laughs> you trying to take a picture? Now remember, if you take a picture of my slides, you gotta give me credit when you use it. Otherwise, you are stealing. And if you got character, you don't steal. All right. So every time you use, it, you gotta say, "Dr. Miles Monroe says." Hallelujah. Uh, here's Desmond Tutu. What a man. When Messi Mandela was released from prison, they had to deal with some issues with the oppression, and Desmond Tutu was really active in that. He had to manage the forgiveness process. You know, uh, I'm moving too fast right now. Maybe I'll come back next year and do some of this stuff. I just want to give you this last slide. Write this down. Vision without values is destiny without discipline. No matter how great your vision is, it can be destroyed. If you don't have values. So your destiny depends on your personal discipline. Character will always protect your vision. Samson had an awesome vision. God trusted this man. He was supposed to save the people of Israel. But his private life destroyed his public vision. Whenever you decide to do something and you hope no one finds out, 
you are in danger. So never do anything from this day forward that you don't want anyone to find out about. And you'll have character. And that's what they never taught you in seminary. They never told you that in high school. And now you've got a double life. And I used to wonder why men, especially, like superheroes. But I figured it out eventually. Men like superheroes like Batman and Superman. <laughs> because they got two personalities. <laughs> Every Superman has a Clark Clint trapped on the inside. Every Batman has a Bruce Wayne somewhere. Every Samson should have a Joseph on the inside. I wonder who you are right now. Character. Vision protects values. Sorry, vision is protected by values. Vision is interpreted by values. And vision and values is the marriage of purpose and principles. Your purpose for your life is your assignment. Your principles protect that assignment. So don't violate your principles. I am a virgin. I got to protect my virginity. And I won't sell it to anybody. I got married to my wife at age 25. I was a virgin. So was my wife. Now I used to wonder why God tells us not to have sex before marriage until I figured it out. My wife and I have no memories that we don't like. Yeah. So God says, look, do right so you can enjoy your memories. Write that down. Look at your face. Some of you are looking down right now. Oh, dear. oh Dr. Monroe, please lead that. Move on quickly. The first thing you must discover to become a leader is your purpose. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. The second thing you must discover is you must capture a vision for your life. Now, these are not the same. Purpose is the source of vision. Vision is purpose in pictures. Vision is when you see your purpose in technicolor. <laughs> vision is photographs of your purpose. Your purpose is your reason for being born. Your vision is when you see it. And this comes, you know, this, this, this grows. We can learn that later on. But your vision grows as your purpose is revealed piece by piece. And your purpose is not known instantly. You Sometimes you see a portion of it first. And then when you step out and start doing it, then God shows you a little bit more. And as you walk, you see a little bit more. In other words, you never see your complete purpose immediately. Joseph was 17 years old when he saw his purpose. He saw a glimpse of it. He saw himself sitting on a throne, ruling his family, feeding them. That's all he saw. He didn't see the process to get there. Thank God. <laughs> if God had to show you how you can get what you, what you saw, you tell God, keep it. I don't want that thing no more. You know, when I dreamt of what I'm doing now, I dreamt of this. I saw myself speaking to thousands of people as a kid. I saw myself traveling around the world. I didn't know how. I didn't know that they were going to call me a thief through the process. Bring the finances to Miles, BFM. I didn't know they were going to call the visionaires demonic music and cult. If God had told me that, I'd have said, look, let me just remain a school teacher. Your purpose in pictures is your vision. When the leader has his vision clear, then the third thing steps in. You must share your inspiration. We're going to talk about that. In other words, talk about your vision. Talk about what you see. Talk about what you want to do. A lot of people don't. Leaders are always telling you 
what they feel about something or what they think about something. They're not telling you the way things should be. They talk about it. People ask me many times, said, Pastor Miles, I have number one and two down. I got my vision on paper. I know my purpose. Now, you know, I just speak to the Lord to show him what to do. And I said, he ain't going to show you what to do. You got to start talking. Start distributing it. Share it with people. They say, why? I said, because the people who are supposed to have fulfill it don't even know it exists yet. Huh? Vision was never given to be fulfilled by you. You're supposed to sell it. And that's what you're doing. You distribute it. This is what I want to do. Show it to everyone you can. Now, of course, there's a mentality that they, they train you in, this negative mentality. But, you know, if I share my vision, somebody may teeth it. Listen to me. <laughs> Nobody could do what you was born to do the way you was born to do it. Period. And there are people who have the resources to finance your vision. But they don't even know it. Because you're so scared to tell them. Not everyone you share it with will help you or even agree with you. Some may even say, you know, I, I, that's a good idea and I, I, I support you. You know, I pray for you. They ain't got no money. But at least they're with you. And some will say, you crazy. This will never happen. Folks like us don't do these things. That don't happen in this country. And they start attacking it. That's okay. Go to the next door. Then share it again. Christ said when you go out and they don't accept you. He said just dust the dust off and go to the next house. He says. He said don't quit going. No means that they going to come later. A lot of folks who spoke against me are sitting here tonight. They came later. Don't look right now. Just keep looking straight. You know, you know who you are. What you used to say about me 25 years ago. Sure, sure, no problem. I couldn't listen to you. I had to keep going. Go to the next house. Number four, very important. Commit to principles and values. Now, this is very important. If you're going to become a leader, there has to be some things you promise yourself you will not do. You must personally commit to certain standards you will never break. That's what leaders have to do. You have to commit to a code of ethics. A set of values that you will never violate. And number five, five, express your passion. Leaders will always tell you about the things that they are passionate about. Matter of fact, you get tired of them talking after a while. And every time you meet them, they can repeat the same thing. Proof of passion is repetition. Can I say it again? Proof of passion is what? Repetition. If you say something to me with passion on Monday, and then I never hear you say it again for the next four years, you was joking. A passion is like a pregnancy. You tell me you're pregnant, but the baby don't go away. You tell me you're pregnant again, and the baby still don't go away. Even though you talk about it, it stays, and it keeps growing, growing, and growing, until we can't help but see it. That's what passion is like. It's like conceiving a divine assignment from God. And you start telling people about it, even though they can't see it yet. You tell them about this thing that you know you were born to do. You have to fix this thing on the earth. You got to solve the problem. You want to do this. That's like a pregnancy. And even though people can't see it, it keeps growing and growing. What's growing on the inside of you is my question. I know you got a job and you go to your work. And you catch that bus or whatever, you, you park in that spot and you go upstairs in the elevator or whatever it is. You go to that classroom. I know all of that. But what are you pregnant with? 
you know, pregnant people go to work. And the baby goes with them. And sometimes the folks who are around you don't know you're pregnant. They think you like them. They are barren. And that's why you need to keep coming to a place like this every Wednesday and meet me. My name is Elizabeth. When you see me, I make your baby leap. You remember Mary? Yeah, when she got that news, she was pregnant, she went straight to Elizabeth. And the Bible says when they saw each other, the babies leaped in their womb. Be around folks who make your baby leap. Why? Because Elizabeth also was carrying a miracle baby. Tell your neighbor right now, I hope you're pregnant, you know, go sit somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Number six, write it down. Leaders empower others. I want you to get these are principles. The, the, the goal of your leadership is to make other people great. Empower other people. Let the weak believe they are strong. Let the poor see that they can become rich. Let the lost have a map. That's what leaders do. They, they give people hope. They make them believe in themselves. Leaders. And then number seven. Leaders, this is very important. Discipline themselves to protect their purpose. This is critical. All true leaders have a very narrow life. They don't go out too often to weird places. They're very strict on themselves. If you're going to become a great man or woman, you're going to have to become very narrow. Narrow is the road that leads to life. You've got to have such a narrow life that only you could fit in it. Certain things you can't do because you ain't got no space for them. Self-discipline is the mark of a true leader. You don't find them out in the night, two o'clock in a, in, a, in a club. They got more important things to do in life. Are you a true leader? Then you discipline yourself against things that can short circuit your purpose. The greatest enemy of your dream is your lack of discipline. There are many people who are wrecks on the road of life because they were going to a great destination, but they were dragged off through an alley by a lust. Or craving. Great leaders protect themselves because they got to protect their purpose. They always judge what they do according to their purpose. Great leaders are tempted more than you are because they are more visible. So they got to be more strict than you. More opportunities to fail come to a leader because they are in the public arena. Therefore, they got to be more strict on themselves. They must not wear their code of ethics in their minds. They must wear them on their sleeves so everybody could see them. These things I do not do. When I tell people, I do not commit adultery. Everywhere I go, I talk with my wife if she's not there. And if she's there, I bring her up and I talk about her why. I'm sending a message, don't fool with me. You cannot wear your values in secret if you are a leader. If someone comes to you and asks you to compromise on your job, you are the problem. If someone asks you to break a law for you to benefit, 
You are the problem. Because if they would have thought that they could come to you, it's a sign that your character is already in trouble. They're supposed to say, don't even go to her. I know what she, she, she ain't going to do that. They're supposed to say that. But if they came to you already, that means you are living a life that is not loud enough. Leaders declare their values openly. They display their convictions in public. They preach their code of ethics from the mountaintops. Got to protect your purpose. That's number eight. Leaders coordinate resources. I'll explain all of these in detail in the next sessions. But leaders have a way of handling resources. Now, resources, not just money. I know you think about money. But everything is resources. Your time is a resource. How do you coordinate your time in life? How much time do you waste with people who ain't going nowhere? How much time do you waste reading books that don't inspire you? How many times do you waste reading magazines of just fashion? How many times do you waste? How many times do you waste watching movies on LMN after one after the other until 2 a.m. in the morning? How many times do you waste with, with, with situations that don't advance your dream? That's a waste of resources. And that's just time. Everything is a resource. Your friendships are a resource. Your relationships, are they an asset or a deficit? This is the question you must answer. Do an inventory of your friends and see how many of them will get you to where you want to go in life. You'll be amazed how small the percentage is. Choose your friends according to your destiny. Save your energy. People are like leeches. They suck life out of you. And if you're not careful, they will drain you dry and drop you dead. It's a resource. I always tell people, if you are in a group, and you are the smartest in the group, it's time to leave the group. Can I say that again? If you are in a group, and you are the smartest in the group, it's time for you to leave the group. You don't want to be in a group that can grow you, expand you, and improve you. That's why I study more than you, you know. Because I don't want you to leave my group. I always want you to have more to come for. That means the pressure's on me. And then I had to be with people around me who know more than me also. That's why I buy books and CDs and DVDs and keep friends with people who can stretch my mind. Because I have to keep growing. I need folks around me who believe that I can do things and build things and expand things. Sometimes you can outgrow the very board you appointed. Remember that. You can outgrow the people you appointed. And that's why I got to expand the board to get fresh brains. I won't say something that is too deep. I can't say that. You all can't handle that part. No, that's too deep. No, I guess I can't say that. Too deep. That's that's leadership 404. That's, a, that's advanced. I can't tell you that. Okay, that's advanced stuff. That's too deep. All right, number nine. Leaders must manage priorities. Leaders manage priorities. Now, what does this mean? Leaders are very clear on what's important. Not what's urgent. Because many times the things that are urgent are not important. <laughs> Leaders know what's, what's important and then they prioritize. They decide which are the important things in my life. What are they? And they manage them to keep them in order of importance. For well, example to me, God, my wife, my children, my vision. Then you. And I clear in my mind. I tell you a long time ago, if my wife wants to see me and you, and you are dying, there can be a funeral. 
Why? I don't sleep with you. <laughs> it cleared my head. The Bible told me what? To love my wife like Christ loved his wife. He didn't tell me to love his wife. Let me say it again. You all missed that. He said, husbands, love your wife like Christ loved his wife. He didn't say love his wife. My head clear. And there are many pastors in the city who lost their wives because they fell in love with his wife too much and committed adultery with his wife and didn't go home to their own wives and they lost their children as well. I will never love you more than I love my wife. Get over it. My priorities are clear. I'm obeying God when I love my wife more than you. Husband, love your wife, he says, like Christ loved his wife. Only Christ can love you. You're something else. I'm telling you, his wife is an amazing woman. Her name is Ecclesia, beautiful woman. Oh, but she'll kill you. You try to love her. <laughs> can I hear an amen? amen? And that goes for all of you pastors who are ordained. Don't you ever make this church more important than your spouse. You obey God and you always be right. Can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah, amen again. Amen. Yeah, okay, just get quiet on me. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, and number 10, leaders mentor their successors. This is the ultimate measure of a leader is who do you leave behind that's greater than you? Leaders focus on the future and therefore they prepare people to protect what they built. That's what a mentor is all about. A mentor is to preserve what you built. A mentor is to take what you started to the next level. A true mentor will protect what you put your life into. This is very rare, but this is what true leaders do. They prepare their replacement. All right, I want to close with just number one, because I want to, to, to teach these separately. But number one, what does it mean when it says that you must discover your purpose. I call it leadership by design. Okay? First of all, you must discover your sense of significance. That's what purpose is. Purpose is discovering the reason why you was conceived. Leaders are people who have discovered this strange sense of importance to humanity. Now, it's, this is tough for folks in the Caribbean. Believe me, this is very difficult. Because you've been conditioned not to think of yourself as important. That's part of our culture. You know, being brought up here in the Bahamas, strange things took place in being down. For example, we, we were taught, if you, write a, if you are writing a composition, they call it composition, it means essay, right? In school, if you write an essay, do not use the word I. You all remember that? See, some of you all don't talk about Now, my question was, why not? Now, let me tell you why. Because Jesus Christ would have failed that exam. He used I more than any other word. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the door. I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the pen. I am the, he said, I am the gate. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am I. This guy is into himself. He would have been rebuked in my culture. But he knew his significance. When I came to that realization for myself, I had to apologize to myself. I spent years, the first two or three years, rejecting myself. I kept saying, I cannot be that important. I was afraid to be who I am. Significance. You are important to the world. If you were not, 
He wouldn't allow you to be conceived. You were created to solve a problem. You were born to answer a question. You were given birth to be the conclusion to a matter in your generation. You were born to solve a problem in the world. Now, to believe that is tough. Because all they told you is, get a job, pay bills, die. The first thing a leader must discover is a sense of significance. Number two, leaders believe in their inherent ability to achieve their desires. This is important. I'll write this down. Leaders are their own raw material. What do I mean by that? You have to get to the discovery where you believe that what you were born to do, you have what it takes to do it. It's already in you. You got to believe that. This is why I teach in my books on potential. Read all of them, please. Read them, please. Read them. I beg you. Because those books, I explain this beautiful principle. Whatever God calls for, he provides for. Simple principle. If God wants fish to swim, he puts swim in fish. He wants birds to fly, he puts flight in bird. In other words, whatever God demands from you, he already put in you. So God gives you a dream, he's telling you what you could do already. So you don't need someone else's assessment of your ability to do it. People will never tell you the truth about you. They don't even know the truth about themselves. Let me keep asking people, what do you think? What do you think? Forget what they think. What does God think? Let me quote the word of God. Let God be true. And every man a liar. You think I trust you? To assess me? I mean it. And I want you to get that same spirit. Nobody knows you. I don't care where you was born, what kind of family you came from. You is you. I come all right. You are you. That's the proper English. But you is you is right too. <laughs> yeah, you you have on the inside of you the ability to achieve what God told you to do. That's why it's important to hear what God tells you to do. Because whatever He told you is equal to your ability. So you missed what I just said. Whatever God told you is equal to your ability. That's why it's important to hear what he tells you. See, she just got it. See, you know, it hits you when you get it. Right? See, and, and that's what sets me free from being down. When I discovered it, and the Bible taught me this. No one taught me this. I was reading the Bible myself. I was 16 years old, and I saw it. I say, wow, God created everything with the ability ability in it to do what he wanted to do. So I didn't need you to tell me my ability. These are point number three. Leadership is knowing, first of all, that you were created to lead, designed to lead, equipped to lead, destined to lead, and your fulfillment will only be when you are in that leadership position in your life. You will never be completely happy until you are doing what you were born to do. Everything else is frustration. Hmm. My favorite verse in the Bible. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose will what? Prevail. Let me, let me, let me define it for you in Hebrew. The Lord's purpose for your life will frustrate you. Prevail means it will frustrate you successfully. Whatever you were born to do is what's frustrating you right now. You're frustrated because you ain't doing what you really want to do. That's why you hate your job every Monday morning. You got to peel yourself off the bed to go to this place you hate. Why? That ain't what you really want to do. It's frustrating you. What's frustrating you? Not the job. What you want to do is frustrating you. It's the purpose. It's prevailing. 
It's ruling you. You know, my brother used to keep pigeons. And we used to catch the pigeons and put them in coops. Hey, boys, a coop. And you know the coop? <laughs> it's a cage. You put the pigeons in. And there came times when there were so many pigeons in the cage that they had nowhere to fly. And the pigeons began to die. I was a little kid watching my brother. And I used to cry when I used to see the pigeons in the cage. Just dying, just heaving. Beautiful birds. And there was no reason. There was food in there. There was water in there. There was shelter in there. But they were dying. Sounds like a job to me. You got food. You got water. You got a house. And you're dying. Because the pigeons were born to fly. We cooped them up. They couldn't be fulfilled until they were out of the cage. But I saw something, and I'm going to close on this. I saw something very weird. My brother had trained the pigeons to stay in that cage so long. I'm talking to Bahamians and Caribbean people now. African people, Jamaican people. I mean, the cage. They know what it does to them. And my brother would open the door of the cage. Some never left. Even though the door was open. Some left. And they flew away with joy. And then something strange would happen to some of them. They would find their way back. And go back in the cage by themselves. The conditioning of the mind. Listen. 